Aaron. I appreciate it. I appreciate the opportunity to speak to your group and I wanna thank you uh, for running this organization. I think it is very much needed. Uh, cancer is the threatening word and anything that we can learn to sort of uh, help us understand it um, better in terms of ourselves and our loved ones uh, is a great help. And I appreciate the work that uh, uh, the open, uh, your organization does. Thank you very much. So uh, we are gonna go through a lot of things today. Uh, and as the title said, um, we're gonna decode a lot of the, uh, the, the terminology uh, that is used in cancer. So um, bear with me, uh, questions will be at the end and uh, I'll be available for as long as uh, the organization allows me to continue to answer your questions. So let me share the screen. Okay, can everybody see the screen? Yes, looks good. Okay. All right. Okay, so the objective of, of uh, today's presentation is <clears throat> the following. As technology is advancing, cancer diagnostic toolkit and the cancer treatments continue to evolve. The time of personal care by the doctors has now been replaced with almost a corporatization of healthcare. The old model when the physician sat down to explain the problem and why certain tests and treatments were needed has now been, <clears throat> excuse me, replaced by relegating it to other office staff or handing it out or handing you out a stack of printouts as, the, as you walk out of the office. Good medical care requires shared decision-making and shared decision-making requires understanding and knowledge of what is being done and why. So hopefully after today's presentation, the audience will have a better knowledge and understanding of the terms and the languages that are used in cancer care today. So there are many, many types of cancer. So when we say cancer, we are not really talking about one disease. At least there are more than 100 types of cancers right now that are officially recognized. Uh, we talk about solid cancers, uh, which are the cancers involving breast, lung, colon, ovaries, prostate, bones, and muscles, uh, as opposed to blood cancers, which are liquid cancers, or they are involving the, the blood cells, such as leukemia, lymphoma, and myeloma. So you may hear about, you know, something about a solid tumor or a solid cancer versus a liquid one. So that is the distinction. <clears throat> Solid cancers often arise from the lining of the cavities or the organs, like inside the mouth, the mucous membrane, inside the lining of the stomach, the colon, uh, surfaces of the ovaries, surfaces of the abdomen, uh, and so forth. Uh, and when they occur in these kind of a lining, we call them epithelial cancers because they arise from the epithelium. The lining is called the epithelium. Those cancers that arise from glands, like the salivary glands, like the glands of the intestine or the stomach, we call them adenocarcinomas. Cancer, adeno is a gland. So it's a gland, cancers arising from the glands are called adenocarcinomas. Cancers arising from the mucous membranes are called epithelial cancers. The solid cancers that arise from bones, muscles, ligaments, tendons, they are referred to as sarcomas. So sarcomas are solid tumors, but they occur in, in tissues such as bone, muscle, ligament, and so forth. Okay. Staging of the cancer is very important because that allows us to place a particular individual patient at a particular point so that we know what to do about it. Um, it also gives us some sort of a prognostic uh, impo uh, information as to what to expect in the future. And this is also very important when we communicate with each other, the doctors and the scientists talk to each other. So when I read a medical journal and saying, well, 
a new treatment for stage two such and such cancer, I know what stage two means. And that is a universal, internationally recognized system of staging cancers. So it's very important that when a diagnosis is established, ask your doctor, what stage do you think it is now? Or what stage it has become now? And that will allow you to understand, read, learn about it, because anything that you read in the literature about that particular stage will be a very a clear indication of what's going on with the disease. <clears throat> uh, we have treatment guidelines. Uh, and as, as I mentioned earlier, as the technology changes, uh, we are learning new things. We are learning new ways to treat cancer. Um, so the treatment guidelines also continue to evolve. Now the guidelines can be very specific uh, to a group of doctors or group of people. For example, the um, you can have a, a society of uh, cancer doctors and they have their own guidelines called the American Society of Clinical Oncology. The um, the doctors who treat the bladder cancer, the urologists, uh, they belong to the urology association. So they also have guidelines how to treat bladder cancer, kidney cancer, prostate cancer, and so forth and so forth. Same thing with the breast cancer. But we also have national organizations which have created some sort of a guidelines for treating different cancers. Uh, the national groups are, the most important one is called the NCCN. Or the, or the National Cancer Care Network. So um, all the cancer um, hospitals and, and cancer centers of America have gotten together and their experts have formed different committees. So for example, uh, the Committee on Breast Cancer includes maybe 30 or 35 experts from Sloan Kettering, uh, MD Anderson from the West Coast, East Coast, South and so forth. And they meet frequently together and look at the literature and look at the new developments and continue to, and then present a unified guidelines as to how to treat different stages of breast cancer. And they continue to update it as new drugs, as the new treatments, uh, new tests become available. So NCCN is a very powerful group and many insurance companies rely on the guidelines put out by the national, uh, by the NCCN. American Cancer Society has guidelines how to treat uh, different types of cancers. Uh, so there are these guidelines, but remember these are guidelines. They are not um, like written in the stone, uh, but they are very good and scientific and validated uh, guidelines. And uh, many doctors will follow them but you know, each patient is unique, each condition is unique, and each cancer in each patient is unique. And sometimes one has to look at the guidelines, but then also look at the patient and see what is the best option, treatment option, testing option for that individual patient at that given moment. So um, sometimes you will see that the doctors will wear a little bit here and there from the guidelines, which is okay because Medicine is also a, a, an art and a science. You have to know your patient and not everything fits you know, exactly in a box. Uh, so um, the, the, do remember that guidelines are guidelines and they, they give us a roadmap, uh, but we need to use them uh, based on the situation in front of us. Um, this is fairly common slide, and I'm sure that you, most of you know how to uh, how we treat cancer today. Surgery still remains the most important uh, way of treating cancer, particularly when we find it in a, when it is very tiny, small, a lump, whatever, it can be surgically removed uh, and so forth. Sometimes the tumors are large and we cannot have what is called complete resection or complete removal. We may be able to remove it partially uh, because it may be too close to a nerve, it may be close to a particular organ, we may not be able to get to it um, uh, easily and so forth. So surgery can be um, partial resection or complete resection, and certainly it's a um, 
a way to actually cure cancer if it is uh, if we use it early on. We of course all know about chemotherapy. These are chemical drugs um, which can be used as an individual single drug, or we can put them together as a recipe of what we call multi-drug regimens. And we are all familiar with many, many regimens that are used for breast cancer, colon cancer, lung cancer, and so forth. When we use them uh, in a regimen, uh, we look at their effects to be accumulated. So, uh, and the toxicity is to be minimum. So we put two or three drugs together in such a way that they don't become uh, three times as toxic, but they certainly become three times as potent. So the regimens are created in a way uh, to uh, attack the cancer cells uh, and continue to try to uh, prevent any increased toxicity. Um, there's a, a term used as adjuvant treatment uh, chemotherapy and neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and many of you probably already know that. Adjuvant chemotherapy is the chemotherapy that is given after the complete surgical removal of something. Classical example would be breast. A lump is taken out, you do a lumpectomy. There is no more cancer that you can see, you can feel, or you can test by an ultrasound or a mammogram. Yet we fear that maybe some cancer cells have sort of spread into the body and maybe these microscopic spread can be then attacked with uh, the drugs that we know are effective against breast cancer. And so when we use chemotherapy right after some sort of a major surgery, when the tumor has been removed, it, it has to be completely removed. Uh, that is called adjuvant chemotherapy. It is usually time limited, four cycles, six cycles, four months, six months, and then we stop. On the other hand, the new adjuvant chemotherapy, which is a relatively newer term compared to adjuvant, is that when we use the same effective drugs before doing surgery, the tumor is a little bit too big to take out. It is too close to uh, uh, sitting close on top of the bladder. Maybe it is too close to a nerve. Perhaps we can shrink it down a little bit so that then the surgeon can go out and effectively remove it. So giving chemotherapy before surgery is called neoadjuvant chemotherapy. Again, it is limited. It is, doesn't go on forever. You do that and you review the situation. Well, now the tumor has become manageable. Now we can approach it through another means. Uh, and then after that, we can then still do adjuvant. And if the cancer comes back, then we can give regular chemotherapy. Uh, there's also a concept called concurrent chemo radiation therapy. And as the, the word sounds like, it is chemotherapy and radiation therapy given together. The, the reason we do that is that we know that certain uh, chemotherapy drugs actually enhance the benefit of radiation therapy. So when you use them together, instead of using two chemotherapy drugs together, when you put radiation and chemo together, you're getting a better result uh, uh, in shrinking the tumor uh, as long as the toxicity is something manageable. So in head and neck cancers, for example, concurrent chemotherapy and radiation therapy, usually using platinum uh, compounds, is a, is a common approach and it is very effective. So that is something called concurrent chemoradiation therapy. Uh, we all know about radiation therapy. This is a technique in which we uh, shoot a beam uh, of uh, radio uh, of electrons or protons um, into the tumor. The way this uh, treatment works is that the, the radiation beam damages the DNA of the cancer cells. So you go every day and for about five to 10 minutes, you get this beam of uh, electrons or protons being fired at the tumor cells uh, the, and keep damaging their DNA every day. And when we do it on a daily, daily, daily basis for maybe about um, a month or so, uh, the cancer cells start to die because they don't get a chance to recover. They cannot chance, get a chance to repair their DNA. So on a daily basis, we are giving radiation therapy and that's how we will uh, reduce or even have the tumor disappear sometimes. Um, 
So radiation can be given usually as an external beam when you're lying on a stretcher or on a table and the machine is on top of you or on your side. And when the power is turned on, it, it sends a beam uh, of electrons or protons uh, at, that, at that spot, uh, which has been marked by the radiation oncologists. Uh, there's also something called brachytherapy, which is a form of radiation therapy in which you put the radiation seeds right where the tumor is, not from the outside, not as a beam coming in. So this is something, for example, you can put, put uh, radioactive um, gold seeds or radioactive seeds into the prostate gland. You can do that in breast uh, in, in the breast uh, uh, cancer. Uh, there are very interesting way of put for the lung cancer, lung cancer, one can put a tube into the throat and put it right close to where the tumor is into the air pipe and then introduce a tube which is filled with radioactive seeds and leave it there for about half an hour or whatever. And that will, then the radiation is delivered right at the spot of the tumor. That is called brachytherapy. The other words that I've listed on the on the uh, slide here is 2D conformal or IMRT. These are specialized computerized ways of delivering radiation. Same external beam, but it is kind of a, you, you design it in such a way using the computer to match the shape of the tumor. So the tumor is somewhat irregular. The radiation beam also goes somewhat irregular just around the edges of the tumor to try to avoid injury to the normal healthy tissue, but the computer helps uh, make a map of the tumor. And then the radiation machine automatically follows that map. So that is 2D or two-dimensional conformal uh, or so forth. Uh, there's also something called stereotactic uh, radio surgery or cyber knife, uh, which is a very unique way of giving radiation in which we actually uh, plan it out the patient is put on an examining table or the radiation table, and literally the, the, the body is put in a jacket so that you cannot move. And then a large dose of radiation it, you know, is given out as a big beam, but it is pencil thin. So it goes right, it hits the tumor and it does not affect anything else. Uh, and it's just one treatment, one big shot, and that is it. So there are different ways of delivering the radiation uh, to the patient or to the tumor to achieve our desired results. We can use hormones to treat cancer. We can use the opposite hormones. Um, if it's a prostate cancer, we can use estrogens. If it's breast cancer, in the old days, we used to use the male hormones uh, and so forth. Or we can block the hormones. We know that the breast cancer, for example, um, grows uh, on, on, on uh, it needs female hormones to grow. So if we can block those female hormones from getting to the tumor cells, uh, then the tumor will not grow. So we have anti-estrogens. We have drugs that will block the, uh, the, uh, the estrogens from getting to the tumor. We have drugs that will prevent the formation of estrogens. So we have drugs which will block a particular enzyme like aromatase inhibitors. These are the drugs which will block a particular enzyme which makes estrogens either in the uh, ovary or in the adrenal gland and hence reduce the amount of estrogens reaching the tumor. So there are many different ways in which we can use hormones uh, to, to uh, treat cancer. As of today in breast cancer, particularly the tumors which are hormone sensitive and they have not spread anywhere, Hormone therapy is a very effective way uh, to treat them and you don't need chemotherapy. So these are various ways that we can use hormones. And then of course, there are brand new approaches to cancer, the immunotherapies. We have biological agents, which are called monoclonal antibodies. We, we have something called small molecules, um, uh, which are used um, to treat cancer and the most most recent ones are cellular therapies in which we are taking cells, we are genetically modifying them and making them recognize the cancer cells of that individual patient. So it's patient's own cells, immune cells, take them out and introduce them to the gene of, of, the, of the cancer cell. 
So they start to recognize it, grow them in the lab, and then give them back into the patient's bloodstream. And they will go and attack the, 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 the cancer cells and kill them. So these are called cellular therapies. They are relatively new. And then, of course, there are recent cases reported in which we can now actually introduce genes into the cells of the human beings. So if somebody has a bad gene, we can take the bad gene out and put the new gene in. Uh, and that's how we can treat diseases. So these are brand new ways of approaching. Now let's quickly move on to the testing uh, after cancer. Uh, of course, we all know that to establish a diagnosis uh, of cancer, we need to have a tissue. We need tissue diagnosis. We need the, to examine the tissue. How do we do that? Uh, there is something called FNA or fine needle aspiration. Again, the name is fine needle aspiration. You put a tiny needle into the tumor tissue attached to a syringe and you suck. When you suck, you suck out uh, a drop of blood and also a bunch of cells from the tumor. You spread them on a glass slide, you stain them and you look at them under the microscope. So this is a way of looking at uh, the cells. The technology when you look at the cells is called cytology from the cell. So you're looking at the cells and the cells look malignant. Then the pathologist will, the cytologist will report back to you uh, saying that I see some malignant cells, some cancer cells in the tissue where you put the needle in. Uh, we can also have needles which are slightly bigger and they can actually cut a core uh, like a little piece of spaghetti from the tumor. And that is almost a tissue diagnosis because we are not just looking at the cells, we are taking a small tissue using a needle and taking a small core uh, from the tumor. And we slice them, stain them, put them under the microscope and we look at it and that gives us a better understanding. Is it a forming glands? It is making sheets. How does it relate to the other cells in that organ? If it's a thyroid cancer, what are the normal thyroid cells are looking like? And what are the malignant cells sitting next to it that look like? So core biopsies are always better than the FNAs. But then again, sometimes all you can do is FNA. But if you can do a core, then core biopsy is better. And if you can actually get a, a little chunk of the tissue by surgical excision, that will be even better because now you have a much more tissue to work with. There are all kinds of special stains that the pathologists have developed, uh, which will help us distinguish normal cells from the abnormal cells. And the abnormal cells can be further subdivided by using different kinds of stains that are available to the, uh, to the pathologist. So by using different ways of getting the tissue and by using different kinds of stains, we can then come up with some sort of a conclusion, well, this is, a gland cancer and adenocarcinoma, I think it's coming from the stomach because of this particular stain, or I think it's coming from the ovary because of the, this and this stain is positive and this, and this stain is negative. From that knowledge, then we can make a diagnosis as to where this cancer is coming from. And then we have molecular techniques, which are more modern, in which we can actually look at this smaller part of the cell, not just the cell, but we can go deep into the nucleus of the cell. We can look at the chromosomes. Uh, we can stain the chromosomes. We can lick them, look at them and see if they're increased, they're decreased, they are broken, they are translocated uh, and so forth. And not only that, we can now uh, go down further and look at the cell surface and there are thousands and thousands of markers and little proteins on the surface of the cells, what we call markers, and we can identify those markers which will help us make a diagnosis as to where this cancer is coming from. So we, we can do tissue diagnosis, and now almost every laboratory has the capability of doing some sort of a molecular analysis, um, you know, down to the molecules, down to the nucleus, down to the DNA level, to trying to identify so that we have the correct diagnosis. Uh, and so forth. And then, of course, we are now, we can, you know, DNA analysis has become very easy. At one time, it took, you know, weeks and weeks to do a complete DNA analysis of a cell. Now the DNA can be done in five hours. You put in a drop of blood and the machine 
takes the DNA and does the, the whole DNA, uh, you know, which is 30, 40,000 genes and spits out the results within four to five hours. So we are now able to actually uh, use the, the DNA also to confirm. Uh, and also it's very important to uh, follow up uh, patients. For example, if you have a DNA of the original tumor and you have now treated the patient and you think clinically there's no cancer left, but if you go back to the, uh, take another tissue biopsy, let's say from the bone marrow in a leukemia patient, and then do another DNA analysis, see if this analysis matches the, uh, the previous analysis. If the previous can, uh, leukemia analysis or what we call signature, it doesn't show up in the new one, maybe the disease is gone. But if that signature is still present in any shape or form into your new biopsy, maybe then still has some sort of a residual disease. So the DNA analysis has made it very easy for us now to look at, particularly for the blood cancers. Um, the, I just want to spend a few minutes on this because I think that many of you may have heard of or may have been uh, told to go and get yourself a complete panel of DNA analysis, something called NGS or next generation sequencing testing. Okay, they're also called molecular panel tests. These panels can test anywhere from one gene to 600 genes at a time. So they're looking for genes that are mutated, genes that are abnormal, genes that are missing. And by that kind of analysis, it can then tell us what disease it is, maybe what kind of treatment will work and will not, it will not work. For example, we now have drugs that will work on a particular gene mutation. So if that mutation is present, and that is very standard now in breast cancer, in lung cancer, in colon cancer, we must be testing not only that it is cancer, not only that it is colon cancer, not only that it is stage two or stage three, but now we can actually look for certain genetic uh, defects. And if those are present or absent, then we can pick and choose what drugs to use, which will be most effective given that this, this cancer is expressing this gene or is not expressing this gene or is missing this gene. So based on that information, we can then appro uh, uh, approach the cancer and use the, um, uh, uh, the, the right treatment also help us with the diagnosis, okay? So the doctor will say, I want to do the NGS or I want to do the next generation sequences, genetic analysis to look for actionable, actionable gene mutations. Gene mutations or alterations on which I can take some action, either, you know, diagnostic or treatment wise, okay? Um, the, uh, as I mentioned earlier, the classical example will be BRCA gene uh, in, in, in um, breast cancer, okay? Uh, the EGFR gene mutation uh, or the, uh, or the um, HER, HER uh, another gene, that is, uh, we, we test them now routinely in lung cancer, okay? Uh, something called MSI, microsatellite instability, and the MMR, mismatch repair gene, these are always looked at colon cancer. So your pathology report will include these uh, uh, findings because they help the doctor understand uh, the, the genetic behavior or genetic makeup of the cancer, uh, which is different from person to every. So if you have two colon cancer patients, one may have uh, in unstable microsatellites as, uh, will be in, uh, unstable and the MMR may be missing and the other may not be. So the treatment of the two will be different uh, based on the, uh, uh, the genetic markers, okay? Um, for now we have the ability to actually do the DNA analysis, not just on the cancer tissue, but also on the blood. Now, just taking a step back, the cancer tissue that we diagnosed, that we obtained, by what I mentioned earlier, either by a core biopsy or by a surgical biopsy, and it is uh, then preserved, can be used later, even years later, to do the DNA analysis. 
DNA is preserved uh, in these tissues forever. So um, if somebody has a relapse after five years, you can always go back and look at the original cancer. Oh, did, did that per, uh, have this particular genetic defect? Because this new one is showing that genetic defect. Maybe they match. Perhaps it's the same cancer that has come back. <clears throat> so now we can even do this DNA analysis from the blood of the patient. Now, how is that? The theory goes that cancer cells, cancer tissues or cancer lumps continue to shed some cancer cells and which circulate in the blood. And the technology is so sophisticated that it can pick up those few cells. Think about how tiny a cell is. Millions can fit on the tip of a needle. Uh, the, the system can pick up few cells from the blood, uh, recognize them that they are coming from the cancer and then do a DNA analysis on that. So something like this is called liquid biopsy. Uh, and that is available uh, to, uh, to your doctor depending on the need. And uh, if the tissue is not available, then a blood, uh, a blood sample can be set for the NGS or for the next generation sequencing uh, and for these uh, large panels in which multiple uh, genes are tested. Ideally, uh, insurance will cover the gene that is related to that cancer. So many times the insurance will refuse to pay for this 500 or 600 or 300 gene panel, uh, which usually runs between five and $6,000 know, billed to the insurance company. And they will say, well, the patient has colon cancer and these are the three or four known genetic mutations uh, uh, in colon cancer. So uh, we will pay if you do those and our gene tests, we will not pay for the other 500 uh, genes that you have tested. Anyhow, that is between the insurance and your provider and your health plan, and they can all check this out before the test is ordered. Uh, but, and then we also have uh, the same kind of a genetic panels available to determine if somebody has hereditary or familial cancer, meaning that some cancers that run in the family. We talked about the BRCA gene. BRCA gene in breast cancer runs in families. Uh, so if a family is positive for BRCA gene, then a woman can say, well, I want my uh, blood to be tested and see if I have, um, I'm, I'm a carrier of the BRCA gene. Because if I'm a carrier of the BRCA gene, then I can take some actions now before I develop breast cancer. So these new ways of uh, DNA analysis and uh, looking at the genome uh, has helped us now understand not only to diagnose the tech cancer, but to treat the cancer, and but also to look at the uh, the the risks that run in certain families uh, and of risks to individuals when a certain cancer runs in the family. Um, very quickly about the blood tests, um, we are all familiar with the regular blood chemistries that the doctor will order. Uh, we can also test the blood and the urine for certain chemicals that are produced by the cancer. We call them uh, biomarkers. So a blood may have certain biomarkers which are being produced by the cancer tissue. So we can track, track them. Uh, you know, CA125 is an example in ovarian cancer. If it is very high, you treated the patient, patient has gotten better, and so the CA125 CA125 blood test will show that the CA125 level is dropping, decreasing, decreasing, and disappearing. So markers like this can help us monitor uh, patients and track the disease. Um, the uh, Another blood test that we use for blood cancers uh, is called flow cytometry, in which we can use the um, a machine with a laser uh, which can measure the number of cancer cells or the leukemic cells uh, that the patient still has or does not have. So uh, flow cytometry is a very helpful test for uh, blood cancers. Uh, imaging tests very quickly, x-rays, we all know about it. Mammography, we all know about it. The, the, the new thing with the mammography is that we are now doing what is called tomosynthesis, which is like a CAT scan of the breast which uh, uh, takes 
a little slices, images in slices, and the computer puts it all together. It is much more sensitive than the old fashioned mammogram in which there was a machine and it took the image of the breast and it came on a, a X-ray plate and we looked at it. So most of the uh, mammography is now being done as tomosynthesis. We know about ultrasound, which uses a uh, ultrasound uh, to, to go deep into the body or into the organs and uh, it help uh, in finding lumps, tumors, cysts, and so forth. So ultrasound is a very useful technique, particularly in gynecological cancers, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer, uh, or even for prostate and, and, and kidney, ultrasound is a very, very useful test. It has no radiation because it is basically using a sound, uh, a high frequency sound technique. Uh, CT scan or uh, what is called computed tomography. Uh, CT scan, everybody's familiar with it. Everybody has had them or heard of them. Uh, this is a radiation uh, technology. It's like an X-ray. But instead of taking one X-ray, the machine takes multiple, multiple X-rays in a very quick sequence. And then the software, computer software, creates an image that the radiologist can look at it. It is excellent for um, uh, dense tissues like bones and so forth into the body. And it is a very useful test. Uh, you can actually look at the size of the tumor. And as the tumor is shrinking, one can actually continue to measure the tumor ultrasound can also measure the size of the tumors and the uh, uh, reduction in the size can be easily detected by ultrasound. Uh, PET scan uh, is a technique in which instead of giving the radiation from the outside, the radiation comes from inside. The way it is done is that you get an injection of a radioactive substance which is tied to glucose molecule. So they take a glucose molecule and they, uh, they, they um, uh, tag it with a radioactive molecule. You're given an injection and that radioactive uh, molecule spreads all over your bloodstream into your body. Then you're lying down under the machine which has a camera on the top. So these little radioactive molecules then release radiation which comes out to, through your body, through your skin, and goes into the film. So the film then takes an image. Uh, areas where there's too much activity is called a hot spot. So the cancer usually takes up more glucose because it is very actively metabolizing, it actively working. So more glucose goes to the tumor, and the tumor then, uh, and more radioactive molecules get there. So they, when they are sent out, on the film, you will see a hot spot. So that is how a PET scan works, but it does involve radiation, just like a CAT scan and an X-ray does. And now we have a specialized PET scans in which we can use um, very specialized type of chem uh, 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 chemicals. For example, regular PET scan uses glucose molecule, but you can also tag the radioactive substance, let's say, uh, to a molecule that sits that is found on the prostate cancer cells. So this particular uh, molecule will go and attach itself to wherever the cancer cells are, the prostate cancer cells are, because it is tagged to that prostate as a cell membrane. So these kind of a specialized PET scan can be used to detect metastasis or the cancer is spreading or not. So these are specialized uh, PET scans and your doctor will explain that to you. MRI is another way of scanning, but it does not use radiation. It is called magnetic resonance imaging. It uses very high powered magnets, uh, which cause the atoms in the body to kind of shake, and that creates an image. And uh, the cancer tissues, ca uh, atoms react differently to the magnets than the normal tissues does. And that eventually the computer creates an image by using these high powered magnets, uh, which then distinguish tumor from the normal tissue. So that is a very useful way also to look at many soft tissues, particularly uh, nervous tissue ca cancers of the brain and the spinal cord are very frequently checked with the MRI scan because it's a very good way of 
uh, determining it even better than sometimes CAT scan uh, to determine the size, the location, and whether or not the tumor is getting better or not. Okay, so I'll stop here. We have taken about 45 minutes and I will be glad to, uh, I'll stop sharing and uh, we'll then answer your questions. I'm sorry, there's a whole lot to cover, uh, lots and lots of terms and so forth. So, and I did go very fast because I wanted to cover as much as I could. So feel free to ask questions. And then uh, if I cannot cover everything today, and if a question pops up in your mind later on, feel free to reach out to Erin. And she has promised to then send me that email and I'll be glad to answer your questions. So I'm ready, go ahead. I just, I just it's not, go ahead, sorry. We can hear you, go ahead. I just wanted to know if um, you could give the link for this on YouTube, I'd like to watch it again. It was very informative and if I missed any information, I'd like to rewatch it. We'll post it in a couple of weeks. Like where on? On uh, our YouTube page, the Red Door Community Web uh, well, YouTube page. Oh, got you, all right, thank mm -hmm. you. Maybe it was too confusing or too too much, huh? Yes, yeah, so go ahead. Go ahead, Heather. Hi. Um, I actually have a question about the last slide um, where you were talking about the CT scan <laughs> and then the PET scan. So what's the difference? Like, I know, like, with, like, CT scans, sometimes they do contrast. Yes. yes. That's not um, rate, rate, uh radiation or is it or i'm mm -hmm. glad you yeah brought it up i i forgot to mention that so the many of these images imaging scans can be done without contrast or with contrast contrast is basically some sort of a chemical substance either given by mouth or given in, intravenously which enhances the image um some uh, some of these are um not indicated, particularly if somebody has a kidney problem and so forth, certain uh, contrast cannot be given. But generally speaking, uh, a radiologist will do an image without the contrast and sometimes then with a contrast and be able to see if something becomes much more sharply defined. But uh, contrast is uh, does not increase the radiation. The radiation comes from the test itself. So the, so the CT scan is a radiation when you are inside the, do the donut hole and the machine is around you. It is firing the radiation from all the different angles as you are sliding through the, uh, through the tunnel, okay? So the radiation is coming from outside and that images that are thousands and thousands of images that are created by each, each uh, spark of that radiation, then the computer puts it all together in the form of an image that the, ra that the radiologist can see. Okay, so CT scan is very good for looking inside the body, and it is particularly very good for solid masses, um, bones, and you know other tissues, stones uh, in the kidney, stones in the gallbladder, and so forth and so forth, and of course tumors. PET scan, on the other hand, is also a, a technique which involves radiation, so you're exposed to radiation both ways. But as I mentioned, in PET scan, the radiation is given to you intravenously, not from mm. the outside. Ooh. It spreads all over your body. So wherever there is a tumor, it will pick up more of that radioactive substance oh. and will then send it out to the, to the film on, on, on top of you so that the image will show it as a hot spot. So what it does is that if you have a tumor somewhere deep inside that even the cat scan cannot, can, a cat scan cannot see, PET scan will then show up as a hot spot. It will say it's right behind the stomach. It is right sitting on top of that kidney that there's a hot spot. Now do remember that 
PET scan can also be positive in other than cancer situations. All you need is very active metabolism. So if you have an abscess, if you have an infection and there's a big abscess in the belly, it will show up on a hot, uh, as a hot spot on the PET scan because too much glucose will go and too much activity is going on in that area. But if you know the clinical history of the patient, you know the patient doesn't have an abscess, doesn't have fever, doesn't have infection, and you're really looking at a tumor which looks suspicious on the CAT scan or maybe on a barium enema, then the PET scan can be very helpful in trying to determine where it is. Actually, nowadays, most of the PET are done PET CT, which is a combination of PET scan and also a CT scan. So the image has both put together. A better image, more easily um, and more uh, explanatory tells us more, but also it has more radiation exposure. Okay. Does awesome. that Thank make it clear? Okay. Yeah, yeah, it really does. Because I, I remember like when I had, like I had gotten the CT scans and I know like in the beginning, like the insurance didn't cover the PET scan. They're like, nope, we're not going to cover this. But then I think I ended up getting that PET scan because I kind of remember that whole process. So Right. So, you know, for the insurance coverage, uh, you have to make sure that the office of the doctor or the doctor himself or herself, herself makes the clear diagnosis and mm -hmm. indicates why this is being done and why the previous test that was done was not informative, uh, did not have all the information or things have changed and now we want to do this. So I think insurance companies uh, are more um, uh, sympathetic when there is more clinical information as to why the test is done. Unfortunately, if the doctor is busy and just tells the, the office, you know, put in the request for approval authorization for a PET scan and the nurse or the, uh, the secretary does not know why and gives very little information, the insurance company is going to deny it. Right. So one has to make a case that this is something that is needed and uh, this has been done in the past or we want to, something new has happened and now we want to change the treatment or whatever. So I think clinical information provided to the insurance company is very helpful and useful in, in getting approvals for these procedures. And some of them are expensive. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much for that. That really, really helped. Sure. That up for me. Be, be, be active, uh, and be active consumer and be educated consumer. So when the order is being written, talk to them, make sure that all the indications, all the reasons uh, that the test is being ordered is given. In fact, don't leave the doctor's office. Ask them why we are doing this. What mm -hmm. is going to tell us? And if this shows us this, what are we going to do about it? Because if there's no, you know, if we already know somebody has this and there's no further change in the treatment, then why are we repeating a certain test? Uh, and if we are repeating it, we need to know why it is being repeated. And this way you are better uh, prepared. In fact, you yourself can write to the insurance company and said that this is what's going on. And that's why I want this to be approved because my condition has changed and so forth. So, um, you know, keep a list of questions when you go into the doctor's office. And even though they are very busy, they will be helpful. They will answer your questions if you have things written in front of you and say, uh, give me five minutes, I have one, two, three, four. I need to know this, I need to know that. And why is this test being done? And I think that they will, somebody will be able to, if the doctor is busy, the nurse practitioner or somebody will uh, tell you why. And this way you'll be more prepared to, to undergo the test and understand why it is done and what the outcome is. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you. It's very helpful. Thank you very much. My pleasure. I think that's all we have. Dr. Raman, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for your time. I think uh, I've told you, you know, before the lecture, in my experience as a hospital social worker, 
a lot of times, you know, patients don't remember, you know, doctors are so busy. So I think it was really helpful for you to go through those things uh, really clearly. Um, like I had told in the chat, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel and on our website. Um, if you guys think of anything else, you can definitely reach out to me and I'll pass it along to the doctor. And I hope I thank you all for joining today. And I hope everybody has a good rest of their day. Thank sure. you so much. Yeah. I mean, I certainly cannot interfere with your treatment. I will.